Good morning. Would you turn with me to 1 Peter 2? Hutch mentioned that um, submitting to governing authorities, and we, um, Pastor Ted preached on that last week, and it's interesting. So this, this, uh, our, our text to end out or finish up chapter 2 falls kind of within that context. It's, it's similar. And so let me read that. If you want to stand with me for the reading of God's Word, and then you see in a little aerobics, get us up and down, moving a little bit. Starting verse 18 of 1 Peter 2. Servants, be subjects to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Thank you. You may be seated. In our text this morning, Peter's laying out a new paradigm for living. He's giving us principles to shape the conduct of our life. Christianity is not a life of fighting, constantly defending our our rights, constantly fighting against that which is uncomfortable for us in society or in life. It's not trying to win the culture of our day over to a Christian moral ethic. It's not to win the current argument in our culture, and there are many important, difficult arguments and issues. It's just it's, it's so interesting to, you know, to get ready to preach and then just hear the Spirit working in and through our people. You know, and, and as, as Hutch prayed and mentioned the previous portion, as, as Joe prayed as, and, and mentioned um, some concepts that are going to be brought up in here, as Phil prayed and the Spirit's just working in the lives of our people, it's just exciting to see that as you get ready to get up and preach this word that God's already working out in the lives of our people. It's exciting. Christian living is a life of constantly, consistently dying to ourselves. Sounds fun, right? Who wants to die today, right? Who wants to die to our pride, our self-righteousness, and think about ourselves less? Like, who's signing up for that today? Let that be our church growth methodology, right? We'll just grow a huge church on people that want to die to self. That's what Jesus calls us to do. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 39, whoever finds his life will what? Lose it, right? Sounds fun, right? And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 5, 43 through 44, you've heard uh, that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Sons look like their dads, right? Sons sound like their dads. Son oftentimes pick up, I see sons nudging their dads right now, right? You know, sons often have the same uh, likes and dislikes as their dads, right? That's the idea. That's the Christian life. 
to look like dad. Right? The way to finding your life is to lose it. The way of living as a son, right, as a daughter of God, is to love those, love those who don't love you back. Jesus and Peter here flips our typical way, our pattern of thinking on its head and challenges our hearts and our typical self-loving patterns. Peter here calls us to live as Jesus imitators. So Peter starts off with some difficult words for us this morning and and as you get ready to preach on portions of Scripture like this, it can be kind of stressful. You know, he starts off, servants be subject to your masters. Like, man, Peter, couldn't you use different words here? It's so much easier if you, if you said, like, employers and employees instead of slaves and masters. This is really inconvenient here, Peter, you know. But he starts off with these difficult words here. And he says, servants be subject to your masters with all respect. Right, not only to the to the good and gentle, right? Not not only to the ones that deserve your respect, but also to the unjust. Be subject, show them respect to those jerks that don't deserve it. My words, not Peter's. Right. Right, so it's 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 tempting here to substitute the words employee and employer here for servants and master, but the reality is that these believers are living in poverty, which has caused them to be enslaved. And it's hard for us to like, disconnect from our context and try to put our feet in the shoes or sandals of these folks. You know, so so Peter's talking here to Christian. Slaves, Christian house servants, impoverished, working under the mastery of, uh, of, a, of a slave owner master. Like these, this is really inconvenient to talk about, right? This is hard stuff. Slavery, slavery in Roman culture was a part of their economic system of their day. Different than maybe what we understand in America for slavery, but, but similar in a lot of ways. And so, quoting from a historian, Daniel Doriani, Roman slavery was not race-based. Slaves did not look, talk, or dress in a distinct way. First century, Roman slavery was not the same as, as, as chattel slavery in the U.S., where, race, where a whole race of human beings were being kidnapped, forced into slavery, treated worse than animals, right? So you think of slave ships, you think of all this. If you think of rape, you think of, of uh, slave owners uh, impregnating. Their, I mean, you think of all this stuff. That's what we think of when we think of slavery. Like, it's all running through our minds, right? Beaten, maimed, tortured, killed. It's not exactly what was going on here in Greco-Roman slave culture. That's what we think of, and I think, you know, we just got to put it out there. Right? And you think of these words of First Peter that even maybe some of our ancestors might have read as they were enslaved right here in the United States. Wow. You're telling me to respect this man does not deserve my respect? These are heavy words for some people, heavier than most. And so while first century Roman, Greco-Roman slavery was different and seemed to be less horrific, um, a quote from Richard Horsley in his book, Slavery in the Greco-Roman World, legally speaking, slaves were not persons. They had virtually no rights. A slave was the property of his or her master. Therefore, a master could sell a slave at will, right? separating him or her from family and home. People said that a slave is a living possession, a talking 
tool or property with the soul. This is evil. This is demonic. This is not valuing human beings as image bearers and and worthy of dignity and honor. And as I tried to make sense of what Peter here was, was not, why he was not outright condemning slavery. You know, when he seemed to have this perfect opportunity, what's important here is to note that he does call it unjust. He does not condone it. He calls, he, he mentions suffering unjustly, verse 19. He, he does not seem to enter into this political argumentation against the institution of this first century Greco-Roman slavery, you know, maybe because his audience are the ones that are enslaved. They have no power to change this. He's writing to them how, you know, how they can use their enslavement to be a picture of their Savior, to their unjust, unkind, undeserving Abusive masters. That's heavy. It's heavy. It's important to note what Peter is not saying. He's not saying that slavery was right, that it was okay. He's calling it unjust. Nowhere in Scripture do we see God condoning the maltreatment or abusive behavior of human beings in any shape or form. Right? Actually, Jesus was building a kingdom for his people in which there would be no distinction of people based on uh, gender, race, social class, pedigree. Galatians 3.28 says, Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Right? There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or no female, for you are all one in Christ. So the kingdom shatters all these institutions. Just completely annihilates racism, any kind of prejudice, any kind of favoritism. The cross shatters it all. And so Peter, although addressing these folks in a very specific situation in history, he gives us a paradigm that we can relate to as well. And so Peter's not saying that Christians should not work to promote kingdom principles and values that promote human flourishing. He's not saying that Christians should not work, even maybe politically, right, to promote kingdom values that value men and women equally, that value people of all different social classes, races, equally. In fact, we need more people in our government that are gripped by the gospel that are passionate about bringing these principles of grace and mercy, dignity and love to our government. <laughs> Peter's not saying that, there, that there's not a time that the authorities should be notified and an abuser should suffer the legal consequences sorry, of their behavior. He's not saying. In fact, a gospel-infused politic would stand up for the abused and mistreated of our day, in our society, and work to restore, right? You've been given the ministry of reconciliation to restore and bring about reform to show value and love, restore dignity to the world's abused and mistreated. This would demand that the ones inflicting the harm and abuse be brought to justice and pay the penalty here for their wrongs done. That's the role of government. What Peter's dealing with is is people that that he loves in this situation that he can't change. Greco-Roman culture was was very self-centered, right? Very focused on personal freedom and personal pleasure, 
right? People were not valued in the Galatians 3.28 way. Sounds kind of familiar, maybe. Right? And so Peter's trying to help his people see their life through a set of gospel glasses. Right? Through a lens of the gospel to view their own lives and their own suffering and the situation that they were in. And I submit to you that he wants you to see your own suffering in this way. To recognize right, that God had not forgotten them, that their suffering was not pointless, it was not a waste, it was not in vain. Peter's turning misery into mission for them. It's a purpose. Peter wanted them to see the gospel played out through the way that they, that they even uh, treated their unjust masters. He's not saying that what's, what they're going through is not significant. He's not saying it. He recognized the difficulty and the misery that they're in. But he's trying to give them a different paradigm to see this misery and this difficulty that they're in. He wanted them to see that, that, that through the situation they were actually had the opportunity to bring more glory and more fame to Jesus, right? their true and better master. The only master that was truly worthy of their life, their service, their attention, their love and affection. Right? None of us find ourselves in, in, in the position that these Christians felt, uh, found themselves in as slaves, but we can glean these life principles from Peter's words to his enslaved brothers and sisters and ours, right? So, first of all, we, we are a picture of Jesus when we treat people with what I've called missional grace. This is not just being a doormat. There's a difference there. But I'm actually going to treat my, you know, this unjust person that's over me, that's inflicting my pain and suffering at this time. I actually have a purpose to extend them grace. So, this, so verse 18 here of our text, servants be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the un, unjust. This verse, see, verse 18 helps us understand that when, when we're subject to or that we show respect to those that have not earned it, right? They've not earned our respect, that we're showing them grace, we're, we're giving them what they have not earned. Because that's how Jesus has treated me. And so I have this mission in my life not to fight always against the person inflicting me difficulty or misery, but to actually share in Jesus' suffering, to be on this mission to show these people Jesus in the way that I treat them. So when your boss, right, who you don't respect, right, and the list is long for why you don't respect them. When we've all got these lists, you know, he did this, she said this, well, you know, We've got this long list. When, when, when your boss has, has done, you know, that doesn't deserve your respect, when you choose to show them respect despite how they act, you have an opportunity to be a picture of the gospel in real life. You know, how can I possibly treat this person with respect, this guy? He's done this and this. He believes this. He's even got this stupid bumper sticker. We've got to stop and think. I have an opportunity to show this jerk Jesus. Like I've got an opportunity. I can, I can be honest with the way that this person is. But rather than just stopping there, just dwelling on that, right? That's where we're, we're most... And then we're gathering others around us. Man, can you believe what this guy did? And, you know, now we're gossiping, right? Slandering. 
We're really going to get it, and we've got to get support for why we feel this way about this person. To stop and say, well, man, what does Jesus want me to do here? Well, what did Jesus do to me? He died for me. He loved me. Right, so verse 19 says, when mindful of God, right, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. In other words, it requires us to do right thinking. That's what Peter's getting across. Like, you've got to think about your life and the reaction to your situations in life. It requires us to do this right thinking. It requires us to take a step back and intentionally uh, allow the gospel to change the way that we're, that we're treating people, right? Difficult people, immoral people, people who struggle maybe with things that we don't struggle. How are we a picture of who Jesus is for what Jesus has done for me? Like maybe I'm not that gripped by what he's done for me. Maybe I don't recognize quite how much I was in need of my Savior. And that's, and that's coming through in the way that I, that I fight against people and the way that I treat people. Why? Rather than recognizing that, that they're another sinner that's in need of Jesus' grace. And maybe God's put me in this person's life to be that picture, to show them grace and mercy and love despite who they are. So secondly, the gospel, uh, uh, the gospel helps us to be honest about our unjust suffering, but not defined by it. The gospel allows us to be honest about our unjust suffering, but not defined by it. Verses 19 through 21. Our unjust suffering is an opportunity to grow deeper in our relationship with Jesus as we get to experience a taste of, just a little bit, of what, of what he's experienced. So verse 20, when, when we do good and, and suffer, we experience our calling in Christ. Look there, verse 20. For what credit is it right, when you, when you sin and, and are beaten for it? Right? What good is it when you, when you do something wrong and are punished for it? Everybody gets that. Ask my mom. But if when you do good and suffer for it, and you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. This is a wonderful, beautiful thing in the sight of God. To suffer right here, understanding the purpose for, for why you're suffering. And so when we do good and suffer for it, we experience our calling in Christ you know, Jesus redefines our suffering, right? Again, from misery to mission, right? Suffering is our shared calling in Christ. In their context, the suffering that Christian slaves were experiencing was unjust, right? But it was legal in their day. And you can think about the difficulty to be stuck in a system like that. It was unjust and they were being treated subhuman, right? As people, uh, as not pe people but property. You can imagine how difficult that must have been, especially when it wasn't illegal. They had no recourse. They were trapped in a situation where they had no legal means of recourse for their treatment, right? And so, listen, the tactical means to seeing uh, redemption in their situation was to enter into the suffering the tactical means to seeing redemption in their situation was to enter into the sufferings of Christ. To see this as, as their calling, as their mission to share in Jesus' sufferings and to show grace to the ones that were actually inflicting their suffering. This cannot be misunderstood. There was no legal recourse for them. Suffering was inevitable, but it was what God had called them to do. They easily could have become bitter and angry. And we would all understand that. They could have easily become bitter and angry towards their masters, but also towards God. God, why are you doing that? Why are you allowing me to be in this situation? 
But instead, Peter's encouraging them to see it as God's providential grace in their life. Man, that is really tough. Because it gave them this unique opportunity in a deeper way to share in the sufferings of Christ. To identify with Him, to be a living example of the suffering servant who we sing is our good and gracious King. So maybe this was on Paul's mind when he wrote Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. By the renewal of your mind, that by, the te- uh, by your testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Wow. So thirdly, gospel imitation sets us free from former destructive patterns. Verses 22 through 24. These are the typical default patterns that the gospel radically changes in the lives of those who are embracing the gospel, listen, that are embracing the gospel not just to save them eternally, but reorient their lives around it as a paradigm for living here and now, today, not just eternally. Listen, the gospel is not just what gets you saved. The gospel is what sanctifies you daily makes you more and more and more into the image of God, represented most perfectly by Jesus and the life that He lived, the way that He treated people, the way that He suffered and died for people. That's what He's referring to. So these typical default, right, self-destructive patterns that the Gospel is changing in your heart and the way that we live, and the way that we process even suffering and misery. Right? The gospel is not just a key that unlocks the door to heaven, but unlocks the door to flourishing in your life. Right? He, <laughs> and then look at it. He just breaks down our struggles, our self-destructive behaviors when we're faced with difficulty, let alone misery and suffering says there, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Like, what is, the, what is the connection with deceitful words and suffering? Right? We're, we're not willing to be honest when we're going through difficulty. And now we're going to use our words the best we can, the best of our ability, and some of us are really gifted to make the person inflicting the suffering look terrible. To gather the support around us. But the Gospel is reshaping the way that we use our words. To be redemptive. To give life and grace. I mean, this is so radical. And then we look further down. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he was abused, when he was received abusive insults as he's hanging on the cross, did not return insult. Right? This is the guy in traffic, right, who's just giving you the business. Cut you off. He's the guy in the straight lane turning left up by Wawa. You know what I'm talking about. Might have mentioned that a time or two. Drives you crazy. Man, it's, it's the boss that just insults you in front of all your other coworkers.
Maybe it's your spouse who says something really hurtful in front of the kids or neighbors or makes some stupid joke in front of company. And we go from like the most extreme, we're talking slaves and masters, down to the dinner table. Do we become bitter, angry? Or do we see that moment as an opportunity to communicate the gospel? Boss, co-workers, somebody at the gym, somebody across the dinner table. You've got an opportunity. I wrote, I wrote down here, a gospel-shaped life is a quiet life in the face of an unjust insult. When, he, when Jesus suffered, he did not threaten but he trusted God to bring justice. You see that in the text? Trusting God to bring justice may mean trusting the legal process. In their situation, it meant experiencing this deeper intimacy with Jesus in the midst of their suffering, knowing there was no legal uh, help for them. So they were to put their trust in God for their situation, knowing that God would bring about justice for their masters in the end. That's heavy. Listen, you may find yourself in a situation one day that you might even choose to be a picture of the gospel and displaying mercy to someone who you may have the right to sue. or have arrested, or prosecute, I don't know. The gospel gives us freedom in times of suffering to not always think of myself only, right? but to even see the person inflicting my suffering as someone I might have been called to show mercy to because of this great mercy that God has shown me. He bore our sins that we might live. Right? His death and His wounds bring about our healing. Right? True life is not found in keeping our life, but losing it. Just like Jesus did. The key to a flourishing life is not to fight to keep our reputations intact. To keep all of our comforts and stuff, right? But it's found in living in this intimacy with Jesus the suffering servant, right, in the midst of the most difficult situations. You know, it's thinking about myself less and thinking about Jesus more, right? Communicating Jesus more to those around me. And it's recognizing that people are acting out of their brokenness. They don't know better because they don't know Jesus. Do we want them to know Jesus? Are we willing to show them who He is? Fourthly, the gospel-shaped life, last verse, is a life of purpose. Verse 25. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Sheep wander when they're not focused on their shepherd. Without the gospel shaping and guiding, leading our lives, we as Christian sheep find ourselves wandering and straying. Right? Not really knowing how to make sense of suffering and hardship. We often find ourselves frustrated and bitter, right? Not, not knowing why we've been called to go through this difficult time. 
It's only when we look to Jesus, our suffering servant, that, that we're willing to identify as sufferers. Right? Servants, slaves, suffering injustices, doing good and suffering for it. But seeing that, that lifestyle is a path to relational intimacy as we're not alone, but He's right there with us. He understands how you're feeling today. Suffering is not the absence of the presence of God, but oftentimes the direct path to experience it. Let me say that again. Suffering is not the absence of the presence of God, but oftentimes the direct path to experience it. And as we Bring this home today. Are you wandering? Are you really trying to make sense of why maybe God is allowing you to go through a time of suffering? Do you feel anxious and afraid and lonely? You come back to the shepherd, the overseer of your soul. I just lived here, life forever. <laughs> the one who wrote Psalm 23, the one that makes you lie down in green pastures, leads you beside still waters. Leads you, lead you in paths of righteousness. The one that promises that even though you may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that he'll be right there with you. That even though as, as these Christians were surrounded by their enemies, God said, I, make, I prepare a table for you in the midst of your enemies. Listen, whatever, whoever your enemies are, there's a table that he invites you to. A table of intimacy and communion. A table where you can be honest <laughs> about everything that's going on. A table that you're accepted not because you deserve it, but because of Jesus. <laughs> A table that allows you to say the final words of that psalm, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me as I dwell in the house of the Lord. Do you believe that today? Listen, I recognize that these words fall. I'm getting emotional thinking about some people in this room and in our church that God calls on to suffer much deeper things than I have been called to. These words were written to people that have suffered much. And these words have been this paradigm for thinking and processing life for people that have been called upon to suffer much more than us. But can I ask you this morning, do you find yourself in a season of suffering? Maybe it's your health. Somebody in your family's health. Maybe it's mistreatment in a job or a difficult marriage relationship. I mean, man, I don't know what you're going through. Everybody. But I knew, do know that there are a lot more people suffering in this room and are willing to be transparent about it. I know that. You know that we serve a good and gracious king. And these folks, as Peter pins these words to them, 
writes to them knowing that they have unjust masters. But he's saying, you have a good and gracious master that's over your soul. And he guards you. And so regardless of the hell that you go through here on earth, you can know for a fact that one day you'll sit around his table that's been prepared for you to be in eternal, perfect fellowship and truly experience human flourishing as we're in the presence of God.